Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. As many of you know or have personally experienced, we have had some email challenges the last several weeks. Please know that we are working diligently to, to correct those problems. To help us in that process, would you please confirm that you have grace at quakertownbfc.org saved in your email contacts. If messages have been going to your spam box, this should help prevent that problem. Thank you for your help and please contact the church if you have any questions. The Tuesday Fireside Chat on the life of the church will continue this week. Please send us any questions or topics that you would like us to discuss. Our other postings will continue this week as well, with the virtual prayer meeting on Wednesday and Pastor Ron's fireside chat series on the Beatitudes on Friday. Be on the lookout for those postings on the website and the church app. Allow this to be a reminder to remove any distractions so we can worship our great God. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. This morning I'm going to be reading our call to worship and our scripture reading. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Let's pray. Great God in heaven, we come to you this morning and we are so thankful that this is true, that you are the great God and King over all, that you are the one who is above every other name, and that you come and, and you have loved us and you have sent your Son to give us salvation. And so Lord, we do extol you, we do praise you this morning for all that you have done and for all that you are. We seek to praise you with our words and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 21. I invite you to turn there if you have your Bibles. Uh, John chapter 21, we'll be reading the first 14 verses as they will be setting the context for Pastor Ron's sermon. You can follow along as I read, starting in verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Tim Thomas, called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore, therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you now having just read your word, and we are very thankful for what we have read, that Jesus is in fact raised from the dead, that he is alive, that his sacrifice on the cross for our sins was accepted by you, the Father, and that he was raised so that our forgiveness could be assured, 
so that, so that we could truly be saved for eternity. Lord, we, we cannot understand all of the will that, that is yours. We cannot understand all of your ways, but we are thankful because we know that, that without this, there would be no hope for us. We know that without Jesus coming back to life, we would have no hope of salvation. And so we praise you for what we have read. We praise you for your word, which reveals the truth to us. Lord, we, we come to you, though, and, and even as we are thankful, we are, reminded, we are reminded that we are not perfect. We are reminded that, that we needed a Savior to die and come back to life in our place because we, we bear the punishment of sin because we are all sinners. So, Lord, we come to you this morning and we even recognize that though Christ has died, though we have placed our faith in him, yet we still sin and we still need to confess our sins to you. Even there, we, we praise you because we know that you are faithful and just and you forgive us our sins when we confess them to you. Lord, you are so good to us and you have proven yourself to us time and time again. And so we can continue to place our trust in you. Lord, we think of the times in which we live. We think about the people who are around us and, and the diseases that we see. We are tempted to become fearful. We are tempted to worry beyond what is prudent. We are tempted to be anxious because we, we recognize that we are not in control. We recognize that life is fleeting. And we recognize that we are weak. So Lord, we come to you now and we, we bring our burdens to you. We bring our cares and, and our concerns. We bring them to you because you have promised that you hear the prayers of your people. You have promised that you answer the prayers of your people. So we come and we trust in you, that, that you will bring comfort, that you will bring wisdom and guidance to us as we seek it. And Lord, we pray this not only for ourselves, but we pray this for those who are around us. Lord, we pray that salvation would come to those who, who are in fear, that they would realize that the reason that they are afraid is because there does come an end. And at the end of, of each one's life, we will stand before your throne. Lord, we pray that you would bring salvation in a mighty way at this time. We pray that you would use us and, and the, the people of this church to reach out and to share the hope of the gospel with those who are around us. Lord, we also pray for for the many people who have been given responsibilities during this time. We think of our government. We think of medical professionals. We, Lord, we, we know that we have to come and we have to trust them because we, we don't have the expertise to know how and when to fight this disease. So, Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom and understanding. We pray that you would use those who, who have these, these, uh, these gifts, their intellect and, and their passions and their studies Lord, we pray that you would use them to bring about safety and, and life for people. We pray that you would help uh, the people of this nation and, and other nations to, to be able to trust their governments as their governments work for the good of their people. Lord, you have called us to be good citizens, and so we ask that you would help us in times of uncertainty, in times that, that lead us to be afraid we pray that you would help us to continue to be good citizens, even as we are following you. That our faith would be in you, that we would trust in you for all good things, even though we don't understand why and we don't understand all the ends. We know that we can trust you, even as we follow the prudent actions of our government. Lord, we pray for the many people of this church. We know that we have been scattered because we are not able to be together. Lord, we pray that you would bring encouragement, that you would bring comfort to the individuals in this church. There are many who are going through, through pain and, and suffering, and, and we cannot even be there for them, at least not physically. Lord, we pray that you would lift them up through the prayers of your people. We pray that you would comfort those who have lost loved ones, 
that you would be with those who are, who are sick and in pain, who are in need of, of physical healing. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring encouragement to them. Use this body to be that encouragement that they need. We pray now for the rest of this service that you would continue to be present in it. We pray that the preaching of your word would go forth with power. We pray that you would use it to accomplish its purposes and bring to salvation those who hear it or bring to repentance those who need to hear it. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open the book to us. Open our minds to the book. May we hear and understand. May it be driven home that this is your word which comes with your power and your authority. Open the book to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I would ask that you would open to John's gospel to the very end of it. How do you end a gospel? It would seem that John has given us the perfect ending, a very satisfying ending, at the end of chapter 20. Now you'll remember that we've been working through John's account of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and tell me this doesn't sound like a fitting way to end a gospel. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's John 20, verses 30 and 31, and in those two verses, John is telling us that the ministry of our Lord Jesus was much too wide to be fully contained in any gospel or even four gospels. There are many more signs or miracles that the disciples witnessed but didn't record. But what we have in the gospels is all true. Beyond that, says John, who as a disciple was one of Jesus' inner circle of friends, what he wrote was written for a purpose that you and I may believe that Jesus is God's Son, the Savior God sent to those who were dead in their sins, so that by believing we may have life in his name. We must always remember that it is God's intention that we know and trust in the one he has sent, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the whole Bible points, and that we live for him who tasted death so that we could enjoy eternal life. But John's gospel, curiously, doesn't have 20 chapters. It has 21. And John doesn't end his gospel with Jesus' resurrection and a note that everything Jesus accomplished was so that we may believe. Instead, John takes us to two connected scenes that take place after the resurrection. They take place sometime during the six weeks or so when Jesus appeared repeatedly to his disciples before he ascended into glory. John's gospel ends with an epilogue. An epilogue is often what's included after the climax of the story has already taken place. And as we read John 21, we see that several disciples are mentioned, including John himself. He's one of the two sons of Zebedee. He often mentions himself, and he does so here as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But ultimately, John's epilogue is really about just two characters. There's Jesus, and then there's the apostle Peter. And we really only understand why John ends his gospel the way he does if we focus on Peter and we focus on Jesus. For this gospel epilogue is about restoration and recommissioning. Ultimately, it is about how Jesus takes broken sinners and reclaims them so that they may be used for his glory. Lessons relearned. In verses 1 through 14, the passage that Pastor Tim read for us this morning, we see that Peter went fishing. He's gone home to Galilee. Peter, it must be said, has by this time seen the risen Jesus. He knows that Jesus has risen from the grave. 
when Jesus appeared in the place where his disciples were hiding behind locked doors, Peter was there. He saw the Lord. Further, Peter saw Jesus restore Thomas. Thomas, you remember from last week, had denied that the resurrection of Jesus Christ had taken place. He had said in front of Peter and the other disciples, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and, and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. But Peter also saw how Jesus graciously appeared to Thomas and invited Thomas to place his hands in the nail print and in Jesus' spear-pierced side. And Thomas had declared, my Lord and my God, and seeing the doubter had been restored. Well, that's the doubter, but what about the denier? Peter had witnessed the compassionate, forgiving, restoring heart of Jesus to Thomas, but he had not reckoned that the same forgiveness was available to Peter. So he went home and he went fishing. What we read in the first few verses of chapter 21 is not to be seen as Peter home on a rest break saying to some of his fellow disciples, let's go on a fishing trip. Kind of like you or I would might maybe ask a friend, well, I've got this favorite fishing hole where we can catch trout. Do you want to come along? No, this is Peter returning to his former life. Before he met Jesus, fishing was what Peter did. It's how he fed his family. But then he met Jesus, and Jesus had called him, saying, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Peter followed. He, he still fished, but now he fished for the souls of people and as a disciple of Jesus. And Peter got a new name. In John 1, verse 42, Jesus said, So you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, Peter, a stone. A rock. That would be his spiritual name. In every listing of the disciples, Peter's name comes first. But as the disciples go fishing, Peter's discipleship to him seems like a very long time ago. In Peter's own eyes, he was a failed disciple. He's still a leader, you'll notice. When Peter says in verse 3, I am going fishing, all the others say, we will go with you. That's a leader for you. Peter is still a leader. And so they're out in the boat, out for a night of fishing. Now, why? Why had Peter gone back to fishing? Because in his own mind, he had failed as a, as a disciple, and because fishing was the one thing that Peter felt he had not failed at. He had failed as a disciple. What's the last scene we have of Jesus and Peter together before this time? Well, you go back to Mark 14, if you wish. Right after Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he declared that his departure was at hand. But when Jesus said to the disciples, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, Peter loudly protested, even though they all fall away, I will not. Translation, I love you more than the others. I alone won't fail you. But Peter had failed. Three times on that same night, he denied any association with Jesus. Luke tells us that while Peter was still speaking his third denial, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. At that moment, Peter remembered that Jesus had foretold that he would deny the Lord. And Luke 22, verse 62 says, And he went out and wept bitterly. Now Jesus is risen, but Peter still feels his failure as a disciple. He believes that he is finished, that Jesus would no longer have anything to do with him. Have you ever felt like that? Like you've fallen so far or so often that you failed completely, and even though you may know something of the love of God, you feel that you've exceeded the limit and he cannot possibly ever use you again? That's where Peter is. He feels that he has failed as a disciple, and he is unfit for further ministry. So Peter goes back to what he knows best, to what he is good at. And what do we read then in verse 3? But that night they caught nothing. In fishing terminology, they got skunked. 
And you can imagine then the impact that this had on Peter. I'm a failure as a disciple, and now I'm a failure as a fisherman too. But starting in verse 4, Jesus shows Peter the matchless extent of his compassion. He stands on the shore and calls out to Peter and the others. Now, in this chapter, Peter seems like the center of the story, but if you read closely, really every action that is initiated is initiated by by Jesus. It's Jesus who does for Peter what Peter cannot do for himself, that is, restore him to a relationship with his master. Our Lord is so gentle, but at the same time, and we see it here, he is challenging. Those two things don't have to contradict each other. Jesus knows that there are some things in Peter's life that need to be dealt with. But at the same time, this is the same Lord of whom the words of Isaiah refer to when it says of Jesus, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Our Lord is gentle. Even when our Lord is direct, he's gentle. His purpose is to restore, not to destroy. So let's see how he does this with Peter. One of the first things Jesus does is he reminds Peter that he cannot go back to his old life once he started following Jesus. He stands on the shore and says, children, do you have any fish? Now Jesus knows they haven't caught anything. But Peter needs a reminder of his failure that without me, you can do nothing. Peter, if you think you're going back to your old life, you cannot. You need to remember, Peter, though, that with Jesus, all things are possible. And so even though Peter and the others don't know it's Jesus who's calling them, maybe that's because there's an early morning mist that obscures their view, or perhaps it's because Jesus' resurrection body is sometimes recognizable and sometimes not. They hear him say, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some fish. They do, and they go from skunk to so successful that they struggle to haul in the nets. I love John's eyewitness eye for detail. There were 153 fish, exactly, not 152, not 154, 153. Now, why is that important? Well, it isn't really. Other than for the fact that the details support the truthfulness of the story. I've never been on a fishing trip where I didn't count the fish I caught. And obviously, they'd count them up. So they divide the fish evenly between the fishermen. Now what comes to mind for many of us, even as we think about the details of this, is probably what also came to mind for Peter and John and the others that day. That this is deja vu. For there had been another time when they fished all night without success. You can read about it in Luke chapter 5. According to Luke 5, Jesus had called to them and had even used one of their boats as a venue to teach the crowds. And when he was finished teaching, he said to them, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. They humored him on that day. Who was he, a teacher, to school the fishing experts? But, but they did what he had said. And you remember that the fish practically leaped into the nets. On that day, Peter had been humbled. He had fallen at Jesus' knees and had said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. But Jesus had not departed. He had called Simon. He gave him a new name. And Peter left everything to follow him. With those memories striking home, John says to Peter, Peter, it's it's the Lord. And Peter dons his outer garment he had stripped for fishing. He puts on his outer garment and he throws himself into the sea, propelling himself to where Jesus was on the shore. What's Jesus doing? Well, as we read, he's making breakfast and inviting the disciples to join him. This is a fascinating detail. First, there's the resurrected Jesus for whom locked doors are no deterrent, but he's also eating bread and fish with his friends. And second, if you read closely, while Jesus asked them to bring some of the fish they've caught, it would seem that breakfast is already prepared, that Jesus feeds them with the fish he provides, not with fish they've caught. He's saying, I will provide all that you need. Here's a lesson that Peter needs to relearn. On your own, Peter, you can do nothing. 
You won't succeed on your own. You can't even go back to your old life and succeed in the thing that used to provide for your needs. No, you need to listen to Jesus. You need to trust in him. If you trust in him, he will provide for you. Your success, Peter, in life, your success is linked to him. When Peter and the others listen to Jesus, they go from fruitless to fruitful. Peter knew this once. The fact that Jesus is showing him again indicates that the Lord is not finished with him. This is for us too. Failure, even grievous failure, is not the end of the road with Jesus. He died, may I remind you, for sinners. He loves to forgive sin. The second time, the third time, the fourth time, as many times as it takes, as many times as we confess our sins, that's how many times our Lord Jesus forgives. And he delights in reclamation projects, which is what Jesus does next with Peter. Peter restored. Look with me at John 21, verses 15 through 23. To this point, Peter has been relearning some important lessons as part of group. But so often for true restoration, which is what Peter needs, the Lord needs to go one-on-one. One of my favorite Scottish preachers, Eric Alexander, says, Here is Jesus, rather like the school teacher who confronts the whole class And then he moves down through the rows and sits down alongside just one pupil, Simon Peter. This is what we see in verses 15 through 23. Read it along with me. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who had been reclining at table close to him, and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Well, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? It's been suggested that this exchange between the Lord and Peter takes place as they're walking along the shore after breakfast with John walking behind just close enough to hear what they're saying. That is entirely possible. In fact, I like that kind of picture. John certainly witnessed this, and he records it for us. Now, why? Why does John include this? Why do we need an epilogue? Well, at least partly so that we see the compassion of our Savior. Note how Jesus addresses Peter here. He calls him Simon, son of John. That's what Jesus had called Peter at the start, his old pre-disciple name. Peter had gone back to his old life. And Jesus called him by his old name. But Jesus wasn't finished with Peter. And so he asks a question. Do you love me more than these? Well, more than who? What? Who's the these? Now, we could imagine Jesus just sweeping his hand over the whole scene and including Peter's friends, fishing, the whole lot. But that's probably not what Jesus is saying. 
He's asking Peter about the quality of his love. Remember when Peter had said, even if everyone else falls away, I never will? That is equivalent to saying, I love you more, Lord, than all the others do. And so when Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He's asking Peter, do you still boast that you love me more than the others do? This is about love. It's about love for Jesus. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Now much is made of the language of love in this passage. We don't see it in English because we have just one word for love, love. But in Greek, the language here alternates between two different words. It alternates between agapao, agape, the highest form of love, the kind of love that is especially descriptive of God. When we read in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love, or in 1 John 4, 19 that we love because he first loved us, that's agapao, that's agape. James Montgomery Boyce, he calls agapao 100% love. And Jesus asked that of Peter the first two times. He asked the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? By the second time, though, Jesus asked the love question, he, jo- he drops the words more than these, and he just asked, do you love me? This is the most important question there is, not only for Peter, but also for us. Do we love Jesus? That's what, what he wants to know and to hear more than anything else, that we love him. Everything else that follows in the Christian life flows from loving Christ. But there's also a second word for love that appears throughout this exchange between Jesus and Peter in verses 15 through 17. It's the word phileo, from which we get philanthropist, and even, believe it or not, Philadelphia. It's a word that means love. Dr. Boyce explains it as 60% love. Um, You know, I don't want to make a big deal out out of it, other than to say it's important to note that phileo love is still love. We cheapen phileo by substituting the word like. When Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you agapao me? And Peter responds as he does all three times with, I phileo you, Lord. Peter is not saying, Lord, I like you a lot. He's professing to love Jesus. But by the third exchange, Jesus changes love words. In verse 17, the the third time he asked Simon, son of John, he asked, do you phileo me? Now, is Jesus lowering the standard that he's holding Peter to? Perhaps, but I don't think we should make that much of the change of word. Jesus is still asking Peter, do you love me? And hear Peter's answer. What does Peter appeal to? Not to his own performance, not to his own merits. He appeals to God's omniscience. He says in verse 17, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And that's exactly right. God does know everything. That means that God knows if our love for him and his son and his spirit is genuine or false, deep or skin deep, or really non-existent. We read in verse 17 that Peter was grieved because Jesus asked the love question the third time. My friends, it's not the repetition that grieves Peter per se but the symbolic meaning of that third question, because Peter, of course, had denied Jesus three times. And so three times Jesus asked, do you love me? Peter gets it. It pierces him to the quick. Is Jesus being cruel with what he's doing? My friends, Jesus is never cruel. God is never cruel. In fact, it would have been far more cruel for Jesus to let Peter keep going on as he was, perhaps even thinking that he was forgiven, but no longer of any real use to the master. That is a misconception that many Christians have, that because of our sins, Jesus can't or won't use us. Nonsense. That's not true. Peter is exhibit A of our Lord's forgiving love. This is such a marvelous exchange, and it's so very comforting to those of us to all of us who have failed the Lord time and again. We have a Savior who forgives, 
and grant second chances and third chances and fourth chances and on and on and on. He forgave Thomas, the doubter. And here he forgives and recommissions Peter, the denier. With every one of Peter's confessions that he loves Jesus, whether it's 100% love or even 60% love, Jesus says, good, I know you do. Now I've got work for you, Peter. Now what is that work? We see it here. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Do you know how absolutely stunning these words must have been to Peter? Peter's not finished. Indeed, Jesus is going to trust Simon Peter with the work of feeding the flock as an apostle and a pastor. And when you think, really think about the words that Jesus says, we find in those words the absolute proof that what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 103 verse 10 is true. And I would encourage you, if you struggle with doubting that Jesus loves you, write this in the flyleaf of your Bibles, emblazon it on your refrigerators, somewhere where you can see it every day. Psalm 103 verse 10 says, He, God, does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. There is forgiveness with God. Repent of your sins. That's what Peter is doing here, though not in so many words. He doesn't even use the word repent, but think. Up to this point, Peter has not really had an opportunity to tell Jesus how sorry he is for all that he has done. But now Peter's repentance is found in the words, you know everything. You know that I love you. And that's what Jesus wants. He wants our love. He wants our love of gratitude, our love for Jesus, our love for his saving work. One final thought, and we're done. You know, it would be one thing if Peter's life changed completely the moment Jesus said to him, Peter, I'm trusting you with my sheep. Feed my sheep. That would be, in the minds of many, the perfect ending, for it would be a biblical version of they lived happily ever after. But that's really not how it ends, does it? The ending for Peter won't take place until after he's faithfully served his Lord for 30 years, after which he will be nailed to a cross upside down at his own request, and he will die for his faith in Jesus. John hints at that in what he writes in verses 18 and 19 when he writes that in old age, Peter will be carried where he doesn't want to go, and his hands will be stretched out on a cross. That is Peter's ending. But here in John's gospel epilogue, as soon as we read, Lord, you know that I love you, and Jesus saying, feed my sheep, Peter, still walking by the shore with his Lord, turns back to John, walking just a few steps behind. And Peter says in verse 21, Lord, what about this man? Now, I think John has a few reasons for including this little snippet. Because by the time that John writes his fourth gospel, there's a rumor going around that John won't die before Jesus returns. And John wants to dispel that. But mostly, and for our benefit, he includes this episode to show that Peter wasn't a finished product, and he won't be a finished product until the Lord calls him home in death. Peter does what is entirely natural to do. He deflects attention to another. He does what we do what we're all tempted to do. And he needs the Lord to correct him immediately by saying, Peter, my plans for John are not the same as my plans for you. Never mind John, mind yourself. Peter, you follow me. And so thus John ends his gospel. It ends with Peter, the denier, being restored. And I think John intends for us to put ourselves in the same conversation, for we have all failed the Lord. We've all come up short. We've all denied him in one way at one time or another. But now the risen Lord is taking us aside. And he's asking a direct question. Do you love me? If we do, he will use us. He will forgive us and reassure us and restore us and use us. So the question that needs to be asked this morning, brothers and sisters, do you, do you love Jesus Christ 
Ian Hamilton says, love is the soil out of which our service is blessed and usable to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the compassionate, forgiving nature of your son. That we do not from you receive what our sins deserve. Our sins deserve eternal punishment. They deserve condemnation. But Jesus died for sins. Jesus died for sinners. And he holds out his arms and says, if you will repent and trust in me, you will be forgiven. I can use you as I used Peter, the denier, and Thomas, the doubter. Help us not to give up on forgiveness, but to turn to Jesus for it. Help us to trust that what we read here is indeed true. And it's not just a message for Peter. It's a message for us. May we turn from our sins. May we trust in your offer of forgiveness. You sent your son for that purpose so that our sins may be covered. They may be buried in the deepest sea, may be separated from us as far as the east is from the west. Lord, thank you for all you have done for us. Now help us to trust it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now receive the Lord's benediction. May the God who blots out your transgressions for his sake and remembers your sins no more, may he continually free you from your burdens so that you may praise his name and so that you may gather with the righteous around the Lord who has dealt so bountifully with you. Amen and amen. Go in peace.